Thanks for the uh, generous introduction. I was beginning to wonder who you were talking about and where I could find them. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with the Discovery Education Network. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak with all of you and everybody online. Um, and uh, I'm not yet used to being on TV like this. So. And I'm not yet used to following Barack Obama. <laughs> If I had known, uh, I would have put his house up there instead of the Washington Monument. I want to begin with the inflexible law of learning. And the inflexible law of learning is simply this, and I think everybody knows it, but we always forget it. It's when we do stuff that we learn, not when stuff does something for us. I think especially when we're talking about learning technology and learning networks and adaptive learning and all of that sort of stuff, we need to keep this in mind because we spend so much time thinking about how to get stuff to do stuff for people, we forget about how to get people to do stuff to learn. Learning is personal. Learning is irrevocably personal. The learning happens in here. It could not be anything but personal. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, let's back up a bit. There's this idea of standardized learning. You may recognize stuff from the uh, Common Core webpage there. The idea that the standards refer to all elements of the design, all the way down to domain headings, cluster headings, etc. This idea that everybody should learn the same thing. And it comes from and works in concert with something that has come to be known as knowledge translation. And to, to make the concepts fairly simple, the idea is you take research about learning that you've conducted with thousands of people and you quote unquote translate it into operational principles. So the idea is that you're going to implement research-based best practices in the classroom. In, it, it begins in the medical field, there's a thing called the Cochrane Collaboration, which is a repository of this sort of research. And in education, there's a thing called the Campbell Collaboration, a knowledge base for decisions about educational interventions. It sounds really good, it really does. Not, I'm a researcher, that's my day job. And, and so, you know, research-backed education, who couldn't be for that? But, you know, there's research and there's research. And especially in the social sciences, we've begun to question a lot of, not just simply the research results, but the methods that we've been using even to employ them. And one of the big difficulties with research in the field of learning and in the field of online learning is a lot of it can't be reproduced. Sure, we get an exemplar case here in this school, an exemplar case there in that school, but what works in one context does not work across the board. And if you think about it, you know, if you practice medicine that way, you'd get similar results. If you did the same thing for every patient who walked in through your doors with such and such symptoms, you'd have terrible results because every person is different. And the medicine that will work for one of them won't work for another one. You know, there's this gap between the research and the practice. And we have to look for a richer agenda when we're thinking about learning, learning interventions, and learning practices. We, we need to be looking at how to apply situation-specific practical wisdom, tacit knowledge, or as Michael Polanyi called it, personal knowledge. That's knowledge that cannot be expressed, knowledge that cannot be spoken. Complex links, not just between domains of knowledge, but links between environment and knowledge, power and knowledge, culture and knowledge. And, and look at the partnerships that we engage in, both as, as teaching professionals and as learners ourselves. So, all of this leads us inevitably to personalization. And personalization is this year's watchword. 
Personalization is this year's, oh, fad? No, I don't want to say that. But it's the thing that is being used to address all of our ills. I guess that is the definition of a fad. But let's think about this for a second. Um, one of the neat things about traveling and sitting around in, in this building is you get to find things. And I found a copy of Personalizing 21st Century Education, a framework for student success, sitting on one of the tables out there. So while I was waiting for the day to start, I read it. And this is how they defined what is personalized 21st education, where there's a personalized education plan developed by the teacher in collaboration with the learner, adaptive learning via assessment, grouping by proficiency and not age, where the teacher is the quote unquote director of learning. And the idea here is, and it goes back to the 1960s, things like the Kettering Foundation, individually guided education. You know, and you, you might even be thinking of Star Trek where everybody's, you know, uh, you know, Wesley Crusher and the rest of them are sitting in their little pods and they have their individually presented learning being presented to them. That kind of picture. That kind of picture is, in my opinion, wrong. That kind of picture is, in my opinion, indeed, even dangerous. I'm not going to get too far into the dangerous part of it, but I do want to draw it out and distinguish it from a different picture. So let's look at two different approaches to learning. One approach begins with content, the domain of knowledge you expect somebody to have learned, mathematics, reading, history, geography, pick something. And you master that content in some way, and then that translates into some sort of practice. That's one way of thinking of learning. The other way of thinking of learning is you go in there and you try to do something. You have something you want to do, some problem you want to solve, some challenge you're facing, and you give it a shot. And inevitably, you fail. And that produces a result. And that result is your content. Two very different approaches, right? Think about this. Think about the way these approaches, on the one hand, when we start with the content, we're defining some kind of ideal state, ideal result for learning, this set of knowledge that somebody should have. And at the end of that process, you are going to be tested to see how close you have come to that ideal state and inevitably there will be a gap and then you repeat. As compared to the other side where you begin with practice, which defines a desired state, the problem you want to solve, the challenge you want to overcome, etc. And instead of being tested at the end of the process, you find somebody there who's going to help you and will help you the next time as you try again. You, know, you think about it, on the content-based side, all of learning is based on correction. On the practice-based side, all of learning is based on opportunities and iterations to try again. And it's all, we can think of two different metaphors even, right? On the left-hand side, Knowledge is like a library, a bunch of books, a bunch of chapters, a bunch of sentences, and we'll get those sentences and put them into our head and we will have learned. It's based on requirements, standards, curricula. The environment-based approach is, or the other, the practice-based approach is like an environment. It's a place where we do things where we have people that help us, where we have things that challenge us. Two very different pictures. Well, the content-based approach is personalized learning. The practice-based approach is personal learning. You see, these are two very different things. And to me, the core of the difference between the two methods is in the personalized 
way of learning. We, the educators, are doing something for you, the learners. But in personal learning, you, the learners, you, the doers, are doing something for yourself. Now, where does genuine learning happen? I argue it's where people do, not where people have things done for them. Personal versus personalized. You know the concept, right? Compare between personalized healthcare, where you go to your HMO and they give you a checklist of things and you can pick this and pick this and pick this, but only from these choices, versus personal healthcare, where you manage your own health. Or the difference between chocolatized and chocolate. Chocolatized is a carob substitute, which resembles chocolate, but isn't, whereas chocolate is really chocolate. <laughs> or, you know, uh, think about, for those of you who are car fanatics, right, which would you rather have? A customized car or a custom car? Me, I want a custom car, one that fits me. There was one of the slides earlier shared by Denisha Reed kind of got to that point. And again, this is why I love coming to these events, because I see these things I've never seen before. And so as soon as I see something, I want to steal it and use it and put it in my own slides. So thank you. <laughs> um, you know, and the continua expressed by Bonnie Bray and Kathleen McClaskey kind of get at this and kind of don't, but they kind of do, don't they? The difference between not having much voice, not having much choice versus having the voice and, and making all of the choices for yourself. So what is this learning through practice? What is this idea of learning as in an environment? Well, it's a different kind of model of learning, isn't it? It's a model of exploring, not following. I was going to put discovering there, but I thought it might be too self-referential. Uh, you know, and, and I'll give an example. I, I often use the comparison uh, of, of learning a domain as being very similar to learning about a new city. And that's probably because I'm a photographer, and it's probably because I travel, and I really enjoy traveling and exploring. And there are many ways to learn about a new city. And what's key is that when you enter a city for the first time, you're not simply selecting from a prearranged set of choices, but you actually define your own route. That doesn't mean you have no support whatsoever. That would be absurd, right? Uh, you go to a city, you could take a guided tour. It's your choice. You could get on a bus and have the bus drive you around the city. You could hire a taxi and have the driver take you around and, and give you personalized, personalized or personal uh, descriptions of all the things. Or you can do what I do. In, in this case, this is San Diego. I hopped on a bicycle and just went wherever my nose took me. And, and where it took me, as you can see by the map, is the cliffs by the Pacific and then down a bit. And then carrying a bicycle up this hill, um, which doesn't sound that bad, but it was one of those city rental bicycles, so it was heavier than I am. And that's pretty heavy. So. That's never going to be one of the choices. Never, ever. And yet, that was my best experience on that trip, carrying a bicycle up that stupid hill. Learning is like exploring. Learning is like reading like a scientist. Again, Cindy Moss gave us this slide earlier today. But the idea here is that you don't just start at the beginning go sentence by sentence by sentence and work your way through to the end. You're not ingesting text when you read. You're exploring text. 
you're discovering text. A scientist, and me for that matter, when scientists approach text, they approach it as an artifact that they're going to deconstruct and try to understand, not a novel or, or something that they're just going to sit back and read passively for entertainment. Learning is like the hackathon. This is a, a hackathon at a medical studies conference in Glasgow, and they had the main conference on one side and the hackathon on the other side, and it's really quite funny because you had a room like this room, except bigger, full of academics, and everybody's sitting there listening to the presentations and very serious. And every once in a while, it would be punctuated by laughter from the hackathon as they did whatever they were doing and we still don't know what they were doing, but it was obviously a lot of fun. But the idea is it's immersive. It's you getting in there, getting your hands dirty, and discovering what you can do. People have talked about edu camps and other camps. This is an edu camp that Diego Leal ran in Colombia, in Bogota, Medellin, and other cities. And the idea is that they didn't just stand at the front of the room and talk to people about technologies. They set up tables and had people go from table to table to table, actually putting their hands on the technologies and trying things for themselves, making videos, making audio, whatever. And this is how they approached training technology teachers in Colombia. We heard earlier today, again by, from Cindy Moss, about the STEM camp which again is a great idea, right? And again, you can see them, they actually have their hands on the stuff that they're working with. Learning by immersion. Medical simulations, where you're not just reading about what's inside somebody, you actually open someone up, not a real person, obviously, in this case, but you open someone up and, and try with your hands on. I love this, uh, love this photo because the expression on the guy's face, it's like, my stomach's open. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Flight simulators, classic case of learning by immersion, right? We would not trust a pilot who had not gone through thousands of hours of flight simulation. Why? Because the sort of thing that's going to happen that goes really bad in an airplane usually only happens once. And we want them to have practiced it in a simulator before it actually happens. I actually, uh, that's a helicopter simulator there and it's at Base Gage Town in New Brunswick, Canada. And I currently hold the record for the fastest crash. Clunk. Yeah, <laughs> pretty bad. Neurosurgery, getting your hands on actual neurosurgery tools and practicing, this is a, a 3D setup, you can see it here. So he's manipulating the tools. They have the same heft as real tools because kinesthetic feedback is very important when you're learning by practice. And you go in there, you have a 3D look at, you can see the surface of a brain. Again, not a real brain because it's very expensive. Um, and you practice in this case, taking out cancer tumors. I learned as I tried that, that I am an excellent neurosurgeon and have a backup career. Sim welding, same sort of thing, getting your hands on actual tools, doing actual things. So a word that I learned only a couple of weeks ago, auscultation. Who's heard of auscultation? Anyone here? One person. It was brand new to me. It would be you, yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the guy with all the toys that just preceded me. Um, so auscultation is when you take a stethoscope and, and put it on and you start listening to people's heartbeats and breathing and all of that. And so again, you use a real, steth real stethoscope and real sounds in order to practice it. Why? Because it's a feel kind of thing. You can't just stand up and talk about auscultation. So that's the background, okay? We got a couple of things on the go here. We've got, on the one hand, the distinction between 
personal learning and personalized learning. And on the other hand, we've got the idea of learning by immersion, learning by practice, learning by actually doing in an environment. So how is all that going to develop into learning technologies? We've seen some of the examples, but how do we pull all of this together to approach it in a systematic manner? Well, in my case, and, and remember, this is one set of experiences, one set of explorations, other people's mileage may vary, but in my case, what happened was what has come to be called the Massive Open Online Course, or MOOC. Um, which, as you learned just a few moments ago, was indeed discovered by accident. Um, tell you this story, George Siemens and I uh, have been working on a theory called connectivism. Very simply, connectivism is the thesis that knowledge literally is the organization of connections in our mind, connections between neurons, and that learning is the development and modification of those connections. Okay, so that's a mouthful. Horrible theory to try to talk to people about. Nobody understood it. We didn't even understand it. So we decided, okay, let's have a course, and what we'll do, using classic connectivist philosophy, we will organize our course as a connectivist course. And so we set up the course as a network with a whole bunch of resources that people could bring in and the idea was to build connections. And we called it Connectivism and Connective Knowledge. We launched it in 2008. We were expecting about 22 people because it's pretty niche, right? It's a theory nobody's heard of. And we got 2,200 people and thus was born the first MOOC, completely by accident. But we got and could support 2,200 people because of the way we structured the course. We did not structure it like a book with a conversation area with everything going through the instructor. We built it as a distributed network. Now, following the courses that we developed, there came to be other MOOCs. You've probably heard of them. The Stanford AI MOOC was launched three years after us in 2011. And it got about 150,000 people, proving conclusively Stanford has better publicity than we did, and AI is a lot more interesting than connectivism. Okay, we can live with that. We've seen, you know, Coursera, a company, produce MOOCs, again, these massive open online courses for people to take on the internet, and of course, millions of people have taken them, Udacity, edX, um, future learn from the Open University in Great Britain and others. But the thing is, the difference between these new MOOCs and our MOOCs was that the new MOOCs were based on content, whereas our MOOCs were based on networks. And we're back to that same old dichotomy again, content versus practice. The new MOOCs actually took the idea of the MOOC and marched it backwards two decades and went straight back into, we will present some content to you and you will learn. Well, the question is, if I'm not just presenting content to you, if I'm setting up a MOOC that's nothing but a whole series of connections between people and between resources, how do you learn? And the answer simply, maybe too simply, but I, but I think it's a reasonable answer, learning is a process of immersion into a knowing community. And that diagram and, and corresponding video by Dave Cormier a uh, good friend to George and myself, who's from Prince Edward Island, Canada, talks about how to learn. And, and some of the principles are that you define what success is, you define the resources that are important to you, you define the process and the level of engagement. This is personal learning. It's personal learning completely managed by the individual. So we set up our MOOC, 
Again, we're not doing curricula. So how do you have a MOOC that's about something but isn't about anything? We'll call that the Seinfeld problem. <laughs> I, I have to keep that one. I'll remember that one. So what we did is we went back in time. And we looked at the idea of the course before it got industrialized. And what was that? Well, back before industrial education, students learned on their own. They really did. And their interaction with the instructor or with the professor, even at fairly lower levels, was personal one-to-one. -one. And then the students would form themselves into societies you know, the Cambridge Philosophy Society or the Oxford Society of Letters. I've just made those names up. Those are not real names because some of them were secret societies. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, and so you have this setup where students, you know, have their mentor and they have their societies. And every once in a while, what they would do is try to convince one of the professors to talk for a while on a subject. And so the professor would ultimately agree. He, and it was almost inevitably a he, would say, well, I've got some new research. What I will do is I will deliver a course of lectures on the topic. Where the word course here means series or sequence. That's all it means. And there weren't any grades or exams or tests or anything like that. And the professors would come and basically they'd come and do their thing, whatever it was. And the students would attend or not as they wished. And they would come and do their thing, whatever it was, or not. And that was the course. And the idea here is that the content, properly so called, whatever the professor was talking about, was the thing that brought people into the room and got them talking. But the objective wasn't to memorize the content. The objective was to use the content in order to stimulate the actual learning. You see the difference. So, and this is something that movie producers and uh, authors have known for years. Nobody watches the Maltese Falcon in order to see the Falcon. They really don't. Even though it's in the title, they watch the Maltese Falcon to see the relations between the characters in the film and the intrigue and the backstabbing and, and you know. And in fact, we don't even get to see the Falcon until the very end. And it wouldn't even matter if we never saw the Falcon. The falcon, the content, is what we call a MacGuffin. It's a word from Al Alfred Hitchcock. And the MacGuffin is the object that the plot revolves around. But the key point here is not the MacGuffin. The key point is the plot. The key point here is not the content of the course. The key point here is all the stuff you do around that content. Could be any content. Now that's kind of, kind of a very different perspective on content than is typically the case today, even in quote unquote personalized classrooms, where content is very central and there is the expectation that everybody will learn the same content. But you know, it's just a misunderstanding of what knowledge of a domain is. Knowledge is not the amassing of a body of content in your brain. Mo knowledge is something that is created through exploration, through discovery. It's created through the immersive experience. Cindy Moss hit it dead on this morning when she said, STEM is a culture. Think about that. Imagine your own culture. You almost certainly have one. 
Imagine you're introducing someone from Korea into your culture, unless you are Korean, in which case, imagine you're introducing someone from Canada into your culture. Would you have them memorize a bunch of stuff? Would you, you know, say, well, Mike, here's my culture. Rule number one. Rule number, no, that would be absurd, wouldn't it? You know, you, you can sort of reduce the culture to these, you know, uh, you have to bow in a certain way, you have to shake hands in a certain way. Um, but really, those are only caricatures. But a culture is really something that is much more than a body of facts, is something that you immerse yourself in and gradually become more and more like. You change yourself. It's like my... My first visit to Colombia was in 2006. And it was just after the war. And, and it was my first visit to Latin America. Landed in the airplane, 10.30 at night. My ride was not there. So here I am all alone in Colombia in Latin America for the very first time at 10.30 at night with my luggage and no clue what I was doing and really scared. <laughs> But I made it to the hotel. The first day I was there, I was afraid to leave the hotel. And there are, you know, well, very young soldiers with machine guns standing on the streets outside. By the end of the week, I was wandering around, not far and, you know, not, not everywhere. But the point was I was able to navigate this culture to a certain degree. And I re remarked on it to my friend DL, and he said, well, you know, in the time that you were here, Bogota hasn't changed. You've changed. And that's what immersion into a culture is, is an actual physical transformation in yourself as a result of exposure and experience. And it took one week for me to be changed from someone who was afraid to leave the hotel to someone who was walking around in the parks. Uh, without fear. And it can happen like that. Learning isn't the amassing of a set of facts. Learning is recognition. Being able to see the world in the same way as an expert in such and such a domain. Being a physicist, learning physics, is not just learning physics principles, but learning to think like a physicist, to see the world the way a physicist does. You and I, we just look at this, we see this is a podium. A physicist looks at this and says, that's an inclined plane and I can roll things down it. <laughs> okay, that's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. I say that because I'm not a physicist, so I don't really know what a physicist sees. But the idea here is that we form these basic literacies of any of these cultures, whether it's mathematics, geography, physics, or a culture. And, and we recognize things the way natives in that culture recognize things. We think pretty much in the same way. We draw inferences in the same way, etc. And these become, as Dreyfus would say, second nature to us. We don't reason our way through them, they become habitual, instinctive. And the only way to do that is to immerse yourself into the day-to-day -day activities and the culture of the people who speak it. Speak history, speak geography, etc. And I've always said, and, and I, I think some of the discussion even here today supports this, that the best place to learn about forestry is in a forest. The best place to learn about law is in a courtroom. The best place to learn about farming is on a farm. And this is what our new technologies should support. Okay, so how do we pull this off? What are the technological tools for this? Well, we developed, George and I and Dave and the rest of us, what I call the ARF model, named after Alan Levine, the cog dog, who has a blog 
called the Cog Dog Blog, and I could go on, but he likes dogs. Um, aggregation, remix, repurpose, feed forward. Now again, it's, it's a caricature, right? It's a framework. It, it's not a thing that everybody must follow, but it's this thing that kind of captures the main elements of learning through immersion, learning through experience. So we have aggregation. In our way of looking at things, in the MOOCs and in personal learning generally, the idea is not to give everybody the same body of resources, but rather to lay out an array of resources before them and have them choose those resources they think are most appropriate to themselves. Much like the food that you might select from if you were cooking a dinner. You know, you've got lettuce and oregano and, and salmon, etc. You think of a whole bunch of foods. And you pick the ones that you like or that you're good with cooking at. Good with cooking at. I didn't just say that. <laughs> Um, George Siemens liked to say, the first piece of learning in a connectivist course is selecting the course materials that you are going to use. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense. Now again, you're not operating in complete isolation here. Personal learning is not, oh, I'm, I'm all by myself. Personal learning is still learning in a community. You're connected to other people, and you can see what choices they make. And indeed, if you look at what the experts are choosing, that might guide you. Might. It's not a requirement. You know, maybe I shouldn't be reading what Stephen Hawking's reading. Maybe I should. It really depends on how close I am to Stephen Hawking. So each person selects the materials. And what this does is... It gives each person in the course or in the community a unique perspective. Diversity is really important. There's, in the, the book I referenced earlier about personalizing learning, they had an expression midway through the book about dealing with diversity as though it were a problem that had to be addressed. And they looked at uh, you know, special education students and students who are in poverty and all of that. Okay, I get that. But I think that they should have focused on celebrating, encouraging, and embracing diversity. Because each person, each culture, each language, each background is a different perspective on the world. And all of these perspectives are equally valid and you need all of the perspectives in order to understand the world. It's like the old story of the six Indians and the elephant, right? You can see the elephant from your own perspective. But So the idea here is you gather from as wide a range of sources as possible, not just educational materials, but stuff in blogs, stuff in social media, academic journals, YouTube, whatever gather all the material that you find relevant to your subject. And, you know, it might be, if you're in a different discipline, different kind of materials. If you're a carpenter, you'll gather tools and wood and stuff. If, uh, well, I won't go on with examples, you get the idea. Next step, remixing. What we're doing here is we're taking the stuff we've found from all over the place and we're, as the expression used to go back in the days of Web 2.0, we're mashing it up. We're taking two different things and putting them together somehow. And an awful lot of innovation and discovery happens this way. When someone takes a principle that was developed in one domain and applies it to another domain. So that's what we're trying to do here. So we're trying to bring in the different perspectives, the different points of view, the different expressions of these points of view, and create almost, a, if you will, a picture, a unique picture based on my own perspective. But to this point, I've only been passive. 
Now we need to get creative. We need to adapt the material in a unique and preferably unexpected way. I always like unexpected adaptations. That's where the best discoveries are. It's also where the best humor is. The idea here is that learning is more than just selecting and filtering content. And, and you wouldn't think I have to say that, but I have to say that. Uh, especially to learning technologists. This group, I think, is, is a, I think, I know, is, is different because of all the expressions of creativity that I saw in the talks leading up to this one. But you talk to learning technologists and, and you know, the guys who make those X MOOCs and that, it's, oh no, it's all, you know, if we only had a recommender, that would solve everything. If only we had adaptive learning, that'll pick the resources for you. That'll solve everything. No, you have to create, you have to build. Seymour Papert talked about constructionism, learning through the construction of, of artifacts, of software, actually learning by getting your hands on something. So learning is not simply a process of reception and filtering. Adaptation, it could be translation, could be rephrasing could be importing into a different context. Uh, what is, how did that expression go? Uh, folding, spindling, and mutilating. That is encouraged. And then finally, feeding forward, the F part of ARF. And here is the idea that you're not simply creating content for an audience of one, but you're taking whatever you've created and you put it out into a community. And that really is thinking like a scientist. No scientist would ever announce a discovery without publishing it and publishing the method and showing all the ways that what was done could be doubted, etc. Sharing in public, as I say here, is harder, but it's better. It's better in terms of motivation. It's better in terms of focusing on producing the best possible results. And it's better in terms of the feedback that you get from it. So in, in creating the MOOC, I created a piece of software called Grasshopper. Best name I ever had for a piece, to, piece of software. Um, and just as an aside, that's not a, a high standard. I mean, my other names for software include things like uh, Plank and Plurn. Um, yeah, <laughs> nobody liked Plurn. I, I thought it was great. I built a personal learning environment called Plurn. What are you doing? I'm Plurning. <laughs> Who are they? They're Plurners. Personal learning environment and resource network. Fell like a lead balloon. <laughs> But Grasshopper, everybody loved the name Grasshopper. Anyhow, the idea of Grasshopper is it was a tool that I used, but really that anyone could use. And the idea is to go through these different stages of the ARF, ARF, method, ARF method. So aggregating, remixing, repurposing, organizing, creating a page, and then feeding it forward as newsletters, web pages, RSS, etc. That's also how I publish my newsletter. Which takes us to the technology of personal learning environments. If you're wondering, that's the cat's view? That's our view. That's the cat's view? That's our, I made that up on the fly. It didn't do that in the warm ups. <laughs> so, so we have this new model of work and learning. Sharing, contributing, co-creating, aggregating, remixing, repurposing, etc. You're immersing yourself right into this community. You're doing the things that they do. And what we want to do is gather all of these experiences with different tools, different systems, different simulation engines, etc. and bring them together. What we're doing here is we're combining these experiences and creating one set of data about ourselves with them. We're creating our own personal perspective on the world. So there's an architecture that supports that approach. It's a personal learning architecture. And you might, well, you might be able to read those. 
and maybe the yellow one might be a bit hard, but, but basically we're talking about technologies to produce resources, to place them in repositories and attach rights to them, to aggregate the resources, to syndicate the resources and share them in a community, to create a common environment for ourselves where we express our identity and have an environment or an interface that we work with. Now, I could spend the next 10 years talking about this. I have, but I won't do it right now. Here's the student's perspective of the same architecture, or you might say the learner's perspective, or even better, you might say my perspective. Student, you are at the center. You're the big blue dot with the smiley face and surrounding you are other students, other tools, other resources. So if you picture yourself in an environment, you've selected what you want to do, and now you just grab the tools and the contacts and the resources you need from that environment and pull them in, do stuff with them, remix, repurpose, and then send them back out. So that's a personal learning environment. It can be a single tool, it can be a set of tools, doesn't matter. What matters here is the concept. At the heart of that is the personal learning record. This will be the big thing of, say, the next 10 years. Everybody's talking about personalizing, adapting, etc. The personal learning record is going to be the big thing. It's your learning data. Now, in my view, strictly my view. This should be owned by the individual person and shared only with permission. You have no idea how hard a position that is to maintain. I've, I've talked about this model with companies, with governments, with, with international agencies, and the first question is always, well, what if someone wants this piece of knowledge? Or how can you do recommendations without just grabbing all their data? And my response is, it needs to be personally owned. Now, the record can have artifacts that you share and provide evidence for your learning. Some of that was discussed earlier today. You can have activity records, which would be stored in a learning record store. You can have a portfolio with artifacts, etc. You can have, out of which you can build other educational resources, badges, certificates, the like. So you can choose to share all these things or you can choose to keep them private, of course. Everything else in your personal learning environment is built around this personal learning record. What is built around? Well, there's the aggregation part. Stuff goes out, stuff comes in. There's your personal library that might be in the cloud of pictures, books, movies, etc. There's the learning activities you undertake, and then any analytics or, or external services that you might access just from the cloud. Now, this isn't something that I've invented all by myself. I'd love to take credit for it, but I won't. There's a bunch of personal learning environment projects that have been ongoing for maybe the last 10 years, and they're all sort of working around this idea of the personal learning record. Uh, responsive open learning environments, for example, from Europe, Roll, Known, which is a company operated by Ben Wordmuller uh, on the West Coast, Learning Locker um, by the other person who founded ELG, uh, Dave Tosh, Mahara, which is uh, an environment you're probably familiar with. So the idea of this aggregation is you're taking your data, you're analyzing it, and then you're putting it into a format that you can use on a day-to-day -day basis. And you're taking this personal data and using it for yourself. And again, nobody else gets access to it. You add creativity tools, and this was, I snagged this from the uh, Twitter feed from this morning. So thank you, Charity Harbeck. You have made my slide presentation. And the, with, with uh, your depiction from Padlet. Uh, 
create things, create images, videos, audio, whatever, store them in your personal cloud. And I'll, I'll shout out here, own cloud is a personal cloud solution you can have on your own hard drive sitting in your living room. You do not need Google Drive or Microsoft OneDrive or whatever. It's a distributed network. The idea here is that some of your stuff is here, some of your stuff is here, some of your stuff is here. Your personal learning record keeps track of all of where all of that stuff is. And your personal record is yours. You hang on to it. It has all, all the links to all of your stuff. And when you leave your school or your employer, you take your personal learning record and you walk away with it. What a change from the environment today where if you leave your school or you leave your learning or you leave your university, all your records are left behind you. It connects you to real learning and real workplace environments. The actual work you do on the job as well as the training, the practice, the community service, etc. All of that feeds into your personal learning record and it's a lifetime record. So what's next? Where do we go from here? Well, we read a lot about Common Core and standards and the things that everybody has to do in order to become educated, to get a job, to meet the employment requirements of the day. But you know, I think that while we're focusing on that, the people who are actually using these tools on a day-to-day -day basis outside of education are inventing new languages and creating new ways of interacting with the world. They are creating their own work environment of the future. And so when we think about how best to prepare them for that world, we're thinking about how best to prepare them to be speakers of their own language, creators of their own future, makers of their own destiny. So I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to this. I'm Stephen Downs, and it's been a pleasure being able to address the Discovery Education Network. Thank you.